Are they going to go for it? Oh, rolling thunder by Gaethje. Yeah, Max is doing it. He's doing it. Come on, let's go. Let's go. He's doing it. He's putting it. Go. Come on. God, yes. yes. <laughs> what? UFC 300, oh my days. What a banger of event that was. Where are we going to start with this? We're going to start with the main moment of the night. It was Max Holloway versus Justin Gaethje. What? That's probably the best moment in UFC history. Try and name another moment better than that in the last five years. I actually challenge us to do so right now. Max Holloway, we're going to come right out the gate and we're going to break down that fight. Max Holloway came out and he dominated Justin Literally from bell to bell. He was up 3-1. He was winning the fight. And in, in the last 10 seconds, he done exactly what I asked him to do in my predictions video. I said, I'd love to see Max come out at the end and go point at the floor and say, come on, let's have it. Max was dominating the entire fight and then walked to the center of the cage with Justin and went like that. Let's go. Let's have it here right now. In the last 10 seconds, he didn't have to do it. Max is goated. For this reason, he is the BMF. He did not try and play it safe. He did not try and stay on the outside. I actually, I think I said on the live stream that we've done, Max can just play it safe now. He can coast through this fifth round and walk away with an easy decision. And he didn't. What an absolute incredible fight that was. And Max got 600 grand bonus. Like he got the fight of the night and. He got the finish of the night and performance of the night, whatever. He made 600 grand just in bonuses. I actually took notes down on my live stream. I was taking notes of every single fight, and I ended up just stopped taking notes because the event was just that sick. I was just, I was just having too much fun with it. So let's just go through the first few fights anyway. Let's not get too ahead of ourselves. First off, we had Davidson Figueiredo versus Cody Garbrandt. Now, I actually said in my predictions video that I think Figueiredo was going to get... I think it was a third round stoppage. He actually got a submission in round two. So I got it right. I didn't get the specific result right. So now Figueiredo looked a little bit shaky on the feet. I thought Figueiredo would have came out and walked Cody Garbrandt down. It was actually the opposite. Cody Garbrandt was walking Figueiredo down. But then what Figueiredo, Figueiredo done in the second round, he made the adjustment and went, went for the takedown and then pretty much just dominated Cody on the ground. So... Great performance by Figueiredo. He looks built at, is it bantamweight now? Yeah, because he was in flyweight originally. Now he's up to bantamweight. Oh, sorry, it's been a long night. I've only had four hours sleep. And as I say, I've been a casual the last six months as well. But whatever, he's moved up in a weight class and he doesn't look small for that weight class. He used to kill himself to get down to flyweight. I'm going to go with flyweight. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I don't even care. I'm still on a high from last night. He used to kill himself. He used to be shredded with veins popping out, looking like he was on death's door. Now this is a much more healthy weight class for him, and he doesn't look undersized. So great win by Figueiredo. Next we had Bobby Green versus Jalen Turner, and I my initial prediction was that Jalen Turner, sorry, not Jalen Turner, what am I on about? Bobby Green against, who was Bobby Green fighting? Oh my days, I am all over the show here. Here we go. When in doubt, just get the UFC website out. Bobby Green versus Jim Miller. Right, so I thought Bobby Green, I said in my predictions video, the Jim Miller might have been able to get a second round submission on Bobby Green. Just because Bobby was coming off a little bit of a loss, I thought maybe he wouldn't have come in as confident. But Bobby Green was looking great. I was saying on my live stream, the way he just walks with his hands down, he goes like, he literally fights like this. Bobby Green, let me actually show you them full screen. Full screen, Bobby Green. This is how, this is how Bobby fights. Let me get in focus. He goes... Papa. <laughs> it's so funny. And he came out as confident as ever and put it on Jim Miller. Let me just get back to my notes. So Bobby Green got caught in the first round. And this is the thing. Let's give it to Jim Miller here. He did the best he could. And he, and he caught Bobby a few times. It's just that you could tell he didn't really have an... Once Bobby hit into his flow state, but um, Jim Miller didn't really have much of an answer for it. Uh yeah, so Bobby Green got caught in the first round a little bit. He dominated the seconds. You could have argued that Jim Miller took the first round, but you can you can say it for both ways, really. Bobby Green got it, 
got the first round. I'm not mad at that. Uh, yeah, Bobby Green dominated the second. And he got rocked in the third again by Jim Miller. But I was actually saying on the live stream that Bobby Green is kind of like a black Diaz. He wasn't throwing with full power. And I think that's what he'd done really good in this fight. He was just like, ba -ba, ba -ba, ba -ba, just speed, hands down by his side, in the flow state, just just peppering those shots. But the, Jim Miller cut, was it above his eye? Or just, yeah, it was just below his cheek. But it was bleeding like crazy. He was cut open. I think I even heard some fans booing at a moment during this fight. And I understand it's UFC 300. Everyone expects every fight to be freaking crazy and first round KOs. I did expect that, to be honest, with the 300k bonuses on the line. But, like, come on. Booing that Bobby Green and Jim Miller fight. There's no need. And I did think there was a few booing moments that just didn't need to happen. The crowd sometimes can be a little bit fickle. The MMA fans, the casual fans can be a little bit annoying. Jessica. Next, we have Jessica Andrade. Let's pull up the screen right now. we got Jessica Andrade versus Maria Marina Rodriguez. Eh, you know, it was okay. It was an, an okay fight. Marina Rodriguez, I can't remember watching it, one of her last fights. I remember watching it, but I can't remember who it was against because it wasn't that memorable, despite even over, only covering it the other day. Marina has got good hands. She's got really good boxing. Very snappy, very fast, really accurate. Dead long arms. Jessica Andrade was the opposite. She's like that little pit bull who comes forward and throws these like big hooks, big swinging hooks. The only problem with Marina is she just didn't have that power. It's like she hasn't got that finishing potential in her hands. Although she has, it's just that she needs to string together like a five, seven, ten punch combination just to get her opponents out there. She's a bit more of a like a, a Max Holloway, a featherweight type fighter. Jessica Andrade got the win. What was the win? What was it? I can't even remember. Let me just switch it back to me. Uh, let me take a look at my notes. It was, a, it was a little bit boring, just a little bit, but I understand it's the women's division. You know, there's going to be less finishers. And uh, yeah, Jessica, it was a split decision. That's it. Jessica Andrade done enough at the end of the first and the end of the third round to pull out the win. Anyway, who cares about that? Let's move on. Next, we had Jalen Turner versus Hanato Moicano. So, the Jessica Andrade fight, I got that one right. So, so far, I've got this one right. I've got that one right. So, I'm two and one. Jalen Turner versus Hanato Moicano. I said I thought Jalen Turner was going to win by a decision, which was a little bit of a weird prediction. But I thought that because Hanato's good He's a bit of a dog. He's got a really good chin. I just thought Jalen Turner was going to be able to stay on the outside a little bit more, pepper those shots, very dynamic, in-and-out explosive style. I actually thought in this fight, Jalen Turner looked a little bit more flat-footed than he usually does. He didn't have that same bouncy style where he's unpredictable and you don't know what's going to come at you. If anything, he was a bit more predictable. But at the end of that first round, if you remember... Mm -mm -mm, I didn't even put it down in my notes yet. If you, you remember at the end of that first round, Tane knocked down Moicano. I think it was a one-two. He went bang, bang, knocked him down. Moicano fell to the floor, and Jalen just walked, just stood there, looked at him, and then walked away. Like he was trying to get a Mark Hunt walk-off KO, but Moicano wasn't done. So Tane walked off, and then he pointed back. I think it was Mark Goddard, the referee. He pointed at Mark Goddard, like as if to say, "Come on, you're not going to stop it." And that, those five seconds, was just enough to allow Moicano to get up and recover. Then what did Moicano do? He made the adjustments and he came back and then pretty much dominated Jalen Turner. Uh, there was quite a few boos in this fight as well, which I thought wasn't deserving because it was a pretty good fight. Competitive as well. We had the knockdown. Let's see what a put down for me. Notes Moicano got really hurt with the two body kicks. Oh, yeah, that was it. So Jalen Turner, within the first 20 seconds, was throwing the front kicks, the teeps to Moicano's body, but it was like the up kick stabbing, like a stabbing up kick where it goes up into your gut and it hit Moicano and then Jalen Turner knocked him down. So I was a little bit gutted that Turner didn't follow up with that KO because I thought that was a winnable fight for him, but it's okay. Moicano, what an absolute dog. He's a beast on the mic as well. He's one of the best Brazilians out there at the moment, especially when it comes to marketability factor. So, good work by Moicano. Next, moving up the card, we had Sadiq Yusuf versus Diego Lopez. And, I mean, Diego Lopez 
what were we we were talking about him potentially getting one of the bonuses because now he is on a free fight win streak. Let's lower it up. Yeah, so he's on a free fight win streak. I said by accident in my predictions video, oh, he's on a free fight win streak, meaning a two fight win streak. And people in the comments were like, oh, you don't even know what you're talking about. I'm like, all right, okay, chill out, lads. So, uh, yeah, let's see what my notes were for this one. Let's see. Yeah, so Lopez comes out. The both trade low kicks. So Sadiq Yusuf and Lopez back and forth with the low kicks. Very fast switchy, I thought. Damn, this is going to be an explosive fight. You could just tell by the speed at which they were throwing the kicks. Um, got an uppercut. Oh, yeah, so Lopez was able to land a decent uppercut during the back and forth exchange with Sadiq. They had a bit of a scramble. Lopez gets the mount. Uh, and then clinch and body hook and uppercut again. That was it, I remember. Yeah, so what Lopez was doing really good this fight, he was getting in the clinch position, and then he was going body hook and uppercut, kind of like my, what Mike Tyson used to do. Mike Tyson used to go body hook there to bring the elbow down and open up the guard, and then come straight up through the centre with the uppercut. It also reminds me what... Daniel Cormier used to do that a lot as well. He'd get people by the neck, get them in the necktie and go body hook and uppercut. And he'd done it with Stipe Miocic, didn't he? He went body hook, but the overhand right. So a great finish by Diego Lopez. Let's move through these a little bit faster. Next fight was uh, Kayla Harrison. Kayla Harrison versus Holly Holm. So oh, I got that fight right as well. So I'm two and two now. Yeah. Yeah, I'm two and two. Holly Holm versus Kayla Harrison. Now, I originally picked Holly Holm to win this fight, but as you're seeing in my predictions video, I didn't do any research on who Kayla Harrison was. I'll be honest, I don't watch judo. I don't know who Kayla Harrison is. And some people in the comments were like, how do you not know who Kayla Harrison is? I'm like, I don't know. I don't watch judo, do I? But after a bit of research, after the fight, and then when I was watching live, I recognized that. I was like, oh, I, I know her. And then I see, I knew she was then obviously judo champion. Was she like eight times or two time gold medalist in in the Olympics or something? So when I was on the live stream after watching a few of her, a few of her fights and her skills, I was like, right, I'm going to change my prediction to Kayla Harrison. Now you can say that I'm not allowed to change if you want, but before the fight had even started, I changed my prediction. Kayla Harrison, and I, th I can't remember how I said. I think I said first round submission. And it wasn't that. It was a second round submission, wasn't it? Yeah. So, Kayla dominated. Basically, she absolute juice head. Got on top of Holly. Controlled her. And also, I think not enough people were talking about how fast Kayla Harrison's hands were. She actually had pretty fast hands. I noticed, I think it was a, a left hook. It was like getting close to Holly. It was very, very fast. And... um. And also, let's give Holly props. Holly got the reversal on Kayla. So Kayla took Holly down, and Holly was able to reverse her. Holly can grapple a bit, but Kayla, she was she was just too much for Holly. And then one thing I did like about Kayla Harrison as well, on the mic, she paid homage to Holly in the post-fight interview. She didn't come out here and try and be like the big I am. She was like, you know, big respect to Holly Holm. She's paved the way for women's MMA, all that jazz. Right, great. And then from this fight onwards, I stopped taking notes. So I got that one right because I changed my prediction. I got that one right. Calvin Cater versus Aljamain Sterling. I said Aljamain Sterling to win by, I think I said third round submission. Uh, but it was a boring fight. I don't want to say it because I respect these fighters. I understand they're going in there. They're putting it all on the line. Anything can happen. You can literally die in there. But Aljamain, come on, lad. There was 300 grand bonuses on the line. And you're going to come out with a performance like that. I still th stand by my original statement that this is a mismatch. I thought, Calvin Cater's coming off two losses. He hasn't fought in ages. It was a bad Achilles. Sorry, not Achilles. I'm getting confused now. It was an ACL tear, a bad ACL injury. And fighters never come back the same from them injuries. And Aljamain Sterling came out there and played it safe. He could have went for a lot more low kicks. He would have... He, he would have known Calvin Cater's striking would have been inhibited because of that injury, and, and Calvin Cater would have been a lot more hesitant to throw. Aljamain could have capitalised on that, and Aljamain looked big as well. So Aljamain was coming up in weight, which is what I forgot to mention. It was an oversight in my predictions video. But Aljamain was looking like quite thick. I remember saying on my live stream, look at Aljamain's back. He was, he was big. He was physically imposing at featherweight. And he just opted for a boring decision. And it's not that the grappling is boring. The gra grappling can be exciting. 
Aljamain wasn't trying to do anything with the grappling. He had a brief moment, it might have been in the second or third round, where he had like a five second blitz and started like raining down shots. And then that was it then. It was looked like it was for the most of the fight, it was looking like Aljamain Sterling was trying to set up a submission slowly. But these submissions he was setting up over the course of like two minutes. So he was doing something. But it looked like he, he wasn't really doing anything. And then Calvin Cater would just move and slip out of the position anyway. So you're just burning two minutes on the clock. So a bit of a boring decision. And then also, one thing that we all noticed in the chat. He didn't have a moment on the mic. Every single person. Figueredo. Bobby Green. Jessica Andrade. Moicano. Diego Lopez. Kayla Harrison. All got a moment on the mic. Early prelimers. Never get moments on the mic. Every single one got a moment on the mic, apart from Aljamain Sterling. He was the only person on the entire card who won and wasn't allowed a post-fight interview. I didn't see many people talking about that. Maybe a few people did, but we were all talking about it in our chat, saying, like, they've done Aljamain dirty there, but you look through Dana White's lens, and Dana's like, this is UFC 300, and you're going to come out there and put on a performance like that? I haven't seen what Dana White has said. Has he addressed it? Let me know down in the comments below. I'll have a little look after this video. But <laughs> he done Al Jermaine dirty. But it's Dana White who, who you're talking about. You just know that Dana stood there and was like, no, don't give him the mic. <laughs> Proper bad. Right. Now, this is where it kicked off. Oh, man. I'm feeling the excitement again. I'm still on such a high from last night. Yiri Prohaska versus Alexander Rakic. Oh, my days. Like, Alexander Rakic, can we just talk about the improvements that he's made? In my original predictions video, I said Yiri Prohaska. I can't remember how I said he was going to get it done. I think I might have said decision, third round, three round decision. I can't remember. But I said that Alexander Rakic has got really good kickboxing. That's one thing I remember from watching his fights. Like, standing there, throwing the low kicks, throwing good punch combinations, got good power, quite jacked, physically imposing, but really good kickboxing. And... Wow, that was on display in this fight. Alexander Rakic looked like he was on track to having a stellar performance in this fight. I was thinking, damn, like, he's piecing up Yiri. We were all saying in the chat, Yiri's in trouble here. But, <laughs> and he was he was piecing up Yiri's leg as well. So was it, was was Rakic in Southport? I can't even remember. Anyway, so Rakic was throwing the low kick and Yiri's front leg, you can see, he was like, oh, and then he was stumbling on it. And it reminded me of the Alexa Alexander, Alex Pereira fight where once that leg is chewed up, it's hard to close the distance then and Yiri just ends up walking into shots because he can't blitz into distance and then he can't use lateral movements to get into distance because there's, he can't put any weight on that front leg. So it got to the point in this, like in the first round of this fight and even the start of the second round, Yiri was just kind of walking towards him, like stumbling. I was like, this isn't looking good. I was on the edge of my seat, but then Yiri, what an absolute animal. The samurai, shing, shing came out and put it on Rakic. I can't even remember the exact KO. Let me have a little look. So here we go. This is the sequence here. I might have to... Uh, I can't really... Do you know what? I'm not going to be able to play because I'm not going to edit this video. But Yiri Prohaska just started walking down Alexander Rakic. And if you take a look at the range that they're in here, it's just a little bit too close to be kicking range. So here, like, it's it's hard for Alexander Rakic to throw low kicks. And that's a good adjustment that Yiri Prohaska made. He just started walking him down, getting into that boxing range, and he put it on Rakic. And, I mean, look at the body language of, of Rakic here. So, I mean, I don't want to play too much in case I get copyrighted. But there we go. What an absolute fall. Oh, that was it right there, wasn't it? It was one punch. Let me just see. Is it this one? Oh, no, it's just after... Uh... Yeah, I must have missed it. But anyway, you guys saw that fight. Yiri Prohaska, that was one of those moments where I was getting goosebumps. I was like, okay, this card is looking like it's it's on. It's on like Donkey Kong, biatch, as they say. Anyway, so Yiri Prohaska won in the second round by an absolute amazing comeback. Give Yiri Prohaska 300 grand. I haven't seen yet if he's got the 300 grand, but he definitely deserves it for that comeback. What an incredible comeback that was. Next, we have Bo Nickel versus Cody Brundage. Now, my my pay-per-view 
was messing up a little bit during this fight, so I kind of missed a lot of it. And then I had to sort out... Uh, once I sorted out the pay-per-view, it was like the end of the fight. But the bits that I did see, apparently it was quite boring. What was it? Uh, second round submission. I seen everyone in the chat saying, oh, it's boring, it's boring, it's boring. We seen Bo Nickel at the end of the fight. He went like this to the crowd. I was saying, is he doing that to the crowd because they were booing him as if to say, boo back to you? Or is he doing it to himself? Like, oh, boo, I'm not happy with that performance. And then he said in a post-fight interview, he wasn't happy with that performance. And can I just say, even Bo Nickel got a post-fight interview. Aljo, Aljamain Sterling, the former champion, didn't get an interview. Wow. Doing Aljamain Dirty you know, when Bo Nickel had a similar performance and still got an interview. Anyway, okay, wow. We got Charles Oliveira versus Armin Tarazukian. Suzukian. Okay, you know what I'm like. I can't say these, these uh, words. Now, I picked Charles Oliveira to win this fight. I just went a little bit ambitious with my prediction and said first round KO. I was looking for Charles Oliveira to come out with the high guard, like the way he skips in. He kind of like just skips in. Like, do 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 and then, ba bang I was expecting him to catch Armin Tadazukian. A little bit ambitious because I actually know how good Armin was. I was just getting a little bit excited with my predictions. Anyway, Tadazukian looked great. Here's the thing with Charles Oliveira. Right, I love him. Probably one of my favourite fighters right now. Top five favourite fighters. He's a little bit complacent when he's fighting off his back. I said this on the live stream. He gets taken down and because he is so good off his back, he, like, he's really good. Like, he'll wrap you up and get submissions on you. But only if you're not in, as good as Armin Tadazukian is at wrestling. Okay? So, Armin is a really good grappler himself. So, he was able to control Charles and nullify any attack that Charles had off his back. So, rather than Charles being able to make the adjustment of being like, okay, I'm unable to get anything off of you. Why don't I just try and start creating scrambles instead, getting back to my feet and and fight there? Because Charles was having a little bit of a little bit of success on the feet. It was a good back and forth fight on the feet, but Armin was dominate dominating on the ground. And do you remember that axe kick as well? So I was talking about the axe kick that Armin did. They actually freeze framed when he done the axe kick, and he picked his his leg was vertical in the air. Incredible flexibility. And one thing that he done that I really liked about the axe kick is usually when you're throwing an axe kick, if you're in an orthodox stance, so left foot forward, you will throw the axe kick. So the right leg will come up and round like this and then down and chop either on the chest or the head or the guard. Tadazukian done a... It's a it's some, I've done, me, done it myself, but Armin Tadazukian went outwards like this and then in. So it's a little bit less conventional. So just the fact that he didn't do that regular axe kick and he went out and came in with it, I liked that from Armin Sadezukian. He showed a, little, a new wrinkle to his game, a little bit of striking expertise there. So congratulations to Armin. It was a split decision, very close fight. It could, I think it could have went to Charles Oliveira because he had two really close submission attempts, one in the first round and one in the third round. Forgive me, guys, my memory is a little bit vague because I didn't get to sleep until, like, 8 a.m. And, yeah, it's I've already been for the run and everything, so I'm feeling a bit foggy, but I'm just trying to go off memory here because I stopped taking notes. But um, it was very back and forth, and if the fight, if the decision would have went to Charles, I would have been a little bit like, mm, okay, like, maybe that should have been to Armin, but... I can see how they've given it to Charles. I could have rationalised why the decision would have went to Charles. People were saying that Charles Oliveira got robbed. I wouldn't say that. I'm not mad at the decision, but I do see how the decision could have went the other way. But I think the right man got the win. Okay? Next man. What an absolute fight. I mean, I kind of covered it already at the start, but Justin Gaethje versus Max Holloway. <sighs> Come on, we are talking about probably, I'm trying to think of a better moment, like a, an actual moment, okay? Not fight, a moment. And I see, I don't know, I've seen some people in the comments of one of the of the highlights of this fight saying, like, this is one of the greatest KOs of all time. And then people are arguing it, saying, no, no, it's not. Oh, you must be new to MMA. And it's like, no, no, no. There's a good argument for this being one of the best KOs of all time because you must consider the context behind it. 
don't just look at the KO as like, it was just an overhand right. It was a sloppy overhand right. It's like, no, you have to consider the way this entire fight went down, the way Max was dominating from start to finish. He was out boxing Justin Gaethje. No one really predicted it. I know MMA guru, guru went with Max Holloway, so respect to him. He got it right. And I was saying, you know, Max is doing the right thing. He's coming up to lightweight in the proper manner. He, his frame looked good. We were saying on the live stream, his delts were popping, his chest looked good. He didn't just look like a featherweight who's got a little bit more body fat on him with love handles anymore. He looked like a legit lightweight. He was, he was dominating Justin Gaethje from start to finish, yet still at the end, 10 seconds to go. After Justin Gaethje, and props to Justin Gaethje, 10 seconds to go, he throws a rolling thunder, so he does the front flip. And if you take a look at that angle again, the, Justin Gaethje's leg gets close to Max Holloway. He's on the perfect angle. Max Holloway was just a little bit out of reach. Max could have just circled around on the outside, thrown a couple jabs, keep circling, keep circling, let Justin chase him. But no, Max went like that, walked back after the rolling thunder to the centre of the cage, pointed to the cage, said, said, come on, over here, let's go. Come on, Justin, get up. Get up from your front flip. Stand here and went like this. Throw a few punches. Ba -ba 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 -ba. And then in that moment gap, like half a second gap in between the combination, whilst it's all going off, Max went like that again. So come on, keep going. Keep going. And then Max just done a classic body, 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 overhand, right? So as Justin was kind of like this, upright, Max was down here. Body, 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 overhand, right? And he folded Justin. Right, we're not talking about Gaethje just like just oh, a bit wobbled, a bit stunned. No one does that to Gaethje. How cold? Who was it who knocked out Gaethje back in the day with the knee? Was it Alvarez or Poirier? Oh, my memory's losing me. Yeah, remember when Justin Gaethje got KO'd and it was by the knee, but it was like he wasn't like completely out. He was more so just incredibly gassed and then just severely rocked, and he just uh, kind of folded to the floor, and then he was up within 5, 10 seconds. No, this overhand right that Mike, that Max Holloway threw flatlined Gaethje. Gaethje was on the floor for like two minutes. It, it took him ages just to get back onto the stool. He needed help. Gaethje's got a proper solid shin. The, the fact that Max was able to do that, I said on the stream, since when is Max knocking out people? Okay, he knocked out Korean Zombie, but you could argue that was circumstantial. Korean Zombie was really running in towards Max, and then Max threw the overhand right. Korean Zombie made a fundamental mistake, and that's why he got KO'd. This was like, just stand in the centre and let's go at it, and, and just see who gets KO'd. Max didn't have to do that, and that's why Max right there is the real BMF. He, he done everything. He outpointed Gaethje. He, his leg, let's talk about his leg. His leg had an absolute massive friggin' welt on it. It was, it was red. I was like, and, it, and the commentary booth kept saying, like, Max, you know, he's going to be limping in a minute. He's going to have to switch to southpaw. They were saying that from, like, the first round. Max, not once. Like switch to southpaw for more than like two seconds. He like switch to southpaw for a moment and then just instantly switch back and take those shots to his legs. He was barely limping. And then I seen day I seen a clip of Dana White saying, Max is walking. He's still walking around backstage now. He's on the phone to Justin Gaethje. He's walking around. Like he should he said, he said, there's nothing on this table that describes how 3D the lump on Max's leg is. And he's walking around now. Max is the BMF, the true, true BMF right there. Like, absolutely incredible. And then let's just skim through this one. Zhang Wei Li versus Yan. I was calling a how now brown cow because the way he's Yan X and how now, 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 I can't <laughs> What's the name? I can't. Uh, Yao Nan or something like that. Yao. Yeah, 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 oh, I don't know. So I was calling a how now brown cow. Anyway, I think we were all just on a bit of an adrenaline dump because this was actually a pretty decent fight, to be fair. It was back and forth, back and forth. Really, really good fight. But I was still thinking about this fight and still talking about this fight. And we were all, and it was by this time, it was like half six in the morning. I was like, just get to the main event. I need to get to bed. I'm from the UK. I have to stay up super, super late. I've got a family and everything that I've got to deal with. Um, but. Whaley got the fifth round, unanimous fifth round. She got the unanimous decision, five round fight. Good job, Whaley. Um, 
two absolute warriors of women right there. But let's get to the main event. Alex Pereira versus Jamal Hill. Man. Oh, cup. Okay. Pereira's like, nah. <laughs> There's like... Oh! Uppercut by Pereira. Pereira's crazy ground and pound right now. He's KO'd him. He's KO'd him. Let's go, Pereira. 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 Anyway, so last fight of the evening, we got Alex Pereira versus Jamal Hill. I thought to myself, there's no way that you're going to be able to top that Max Holloway fight. Is, th is there a chance that this might be a little bit boring now? Is this going to be a little bit of a letdown of a fight? It was the complete opposite of the Max Holloway and Gaethje. Max Holloway and Gaethje, they go the full distance, technical, like, striking fest. And then in the very last second, he gets a finish. Alex Pereira... Was it three minutes in? Yeah, so there was or there was three minutes left on the clock. Got the knockout over Jamal Hill in the first round. And what was so funny about this finish, as you all know, Jamal Hill hit Alex Pereira in the cup, and you can audibly hear the cup sound. So it kind of caught the top. And Mark Goddard even stepped in, and you see you see Jamal Hill go like that and go, oh, sorry. And then Pereira goes, no, to Mark Goddard. And then walks in straight away. Jamal Hill throws, he was standing in Southport, he throws his right hand. Pereira, ever so subtle with his head movements, dips off to the left and throws this weird, it's his hook, it's his hook, but I said uppercut on the live stream because Alex Pereira's hook comes like this. He kind of just like, like scoops it up. It's a hook, but it's not a hook. And uh, it's just very, very strange the way he throws his shots. And I think that's why he catches people with it all the time. Because the place that his shots come from is so unorthodox and just weird. He's not throwing hooks conventional like most people do or like we're taught to do. It's more so like it's more so like this. And he, he like he scoops it up. And another amazing thing is he he didn't even catch Jamal properly. He caught him, like, uh, just on the very end of his nose, like like this, like like that. So Alex Pereira's not even hit. He's not even hitting people clean, and he's KOing them. Jamal Hill, you watched it in slow motion. His eyes went back, and he collapsed. His ankle gave way, so his left ankle that he was standing on, that gave way, collapsed to the floor. Pereira, bang, 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 hammer, th hammer fists. Got up and then done that thing where he was going, as if to say, do you see this? You see this? You believe me now? I don't know. I, I, I seen some people talk about how that was meant to be something to do with Izzy. So Israel Adesanya was doing something like this and Alex Pereira was mocking him or something. But eh, what an incredible fight that was. I got that one right as well. I said Alex Pereira by... Alex Pereira to win by third round stoppage. I thought it was going to be a bit more of a back and forth. Jamal Hill's striking looked good. Let's... And this is what I was saying. Don't underestimate Jamal Hill. He's got really good striking. They were trading low kicks. Some of those low kicks looked really good. Jamal Hill's punches looked on point. But I did say in one of my last videos, he holds his hands down quite a bit. And so does Alex Pereira. But Jamal Hill isn't on the same level of striking as Alex Pereira. So Jamal Hill lets his hands down a little bit. And he's a little bit sloppy and a little bit off balance sometimes with his striking. But he's just unpredictable and he has also got that one punch KO power. But Alex Pereira is just going from strength to strength to strength. Now, he said he wants to fight a heavyweight. Wrap this up now, guys. How long have we been going for? 33 minutes, unedited. Can we get a like on this video? Because I never do this. This is actually MMA guru style. Just unedited, just all the way through. And I'm going to be doing more MMA content as well. You can see me passion and my energy for this is, is there now. Right, Alex Pereira said he wants to fight a heavyweight. Now, I love Pereira. I, <laughs> he's on his way to being one of the goats. He's claiming belts left, right, and center. He's defeated something like seven champions now, or, or, or something like that, or seven former champions at least. And he's just going from strength to strength. But heavyweight, it's a completely different animal we're talking about. Alex Pereira walks around at like what 235 pounds, a little bit more body fat on him, so that like that's his natural weight. He diets down to 205, then he steps back in the cage around 220-ish. So that's typically what he was saying when he was going down to middleweight, is he diet and kill himself to get down to 185. Then he steps back in the cage at like 220. That's insane. But 220 
to 260 is a massive difference. Alex Pereira versus Aspinall. I love Pereira, but Aspinall would absolutely send him to the next dimension. Aspinall's got a whole... It's a whole different level of physicality. Alex Pereira is quite narrow. He's tall and narrow. He's got big legs, kind of like big glutes. Fairly thick-ish back, big head. But if you look at his frame, he's quite narrow. You look at someone like Aspinall, who is six foot five, so pretty much the same height as Pereira, but he's wide. His chest is like this. It pops like his chest plate pops off his chest. His back is like thick and dense. Got a little bit more body fat on him as well, but his back's th like thick. You look at his Aspinall's traps and his mid back. It's meaty. Ugh, sound proper gay here. That's a whole different level of physicality. Tom Aspinall brings a completely different level of wrestling and grappling to the game, better than anyone else Alex Pereira has fought. And also that power as well. I know Alex Pereira was on that punching machine the other day, and he's got the new record of 190,000 on that power cube. Ngannou was getting 120,000, was it, or 130,000? Alex Pereira technically punches harder than Francis Ngannou, but... I don't know. I just think, like, there's the power cube and there's those punch machines, but then there's actually having a fight with an opponent in front of you. Like, being able to translate that power into the fight itself, it's it's not that simple. It's not a one-for-one -one translation crossover, if that makes sense. I believe that it just wouldn't be a good move for Pereira. Would I like to see him do it and potentially take that risk? Hey, you know I'm going to watch it. You know I'll do a live stream for it. That'd be sick. And if Alex Pereira even just went to heavyweight and got a few wins, not even a championship level. Can you argue with the the, the goatedness of the man? Like, to go in free weight divisions and capture wins across those free weight divisions in extremely tough weight divisions as well? The man is nothing short of impressive. I thought this card was incredible, potentially the best card that has ever been within the UFC. What do you guys think? I really enjoyed doing the stream last night. It was an eight-hour stream. Some of you guys came through with incredible donations and give some positive energy. I appreciate it all. I'm looking forward to doing more of these live streams. And, you know, we're just getting started, so it's going to take some time to build up. But I appreciate all the love and support for those who have been rocking with me, whether you're new to the channel or whether you've been here for a while. I appreciate you. Just make sure you like this video, and I'll see you every single day from here on out. Okay, subscribe. See you later.